This is Leadership in Action, and I'm Mark Stiles, your host. Join me as we delve deep into the passions, expertise, and experiences of Boston area innovators. Sponsored by the Boston Chapter of Entrepreneurs Organization, this is Leadership in Action. Hey, folks, welcome back to Leadership in Action, our Boston Chapter of EO's podcast. Today, I am super excited to talk to a local entrepreneur. He's a landscaping legend and kind of a leader that rolls up his sleeves and gets it done. He has a streak of creativity and passion for design, comes from a financing and consulting background. He's a potential EO member. Hopefully by the end of this, we'll have him as a member of our group. He is the founder and CEO of Jim's Landscaping, James Evans. Welcome to the show, man. How's it going, Mark? I think I'm going to pay you to just follow me around and introduce me to every room full of people I walk into. That was that was above and beyond. I love it. I love it. And I I take uh, I take fee for service. So let's talk about that. <laughs> to get bit, yeah. All right, let's get right into it. You ready? Right. I'm ready. What is a common misconception about leadership, running <laughs> a business, and or being an entrepreneur? Um, I I think the common myth that I've tried to bust has been um, like, you don't really need to quit your job to either start something or even buy a company. Um, I think there's a lot of risk with that. And I think there's a lot of benefits to having some stability and W-2 income, um, especially if you're doing something where you're going to need some financing. Banks, there's nothing, banks love more than you know a steady paycheck. So I think holding onto a job and trying to start something on the side and finding like the easiest way to just get from zero to one, um, the, you know, having that job also is kind of a forcing function and you just don't have time to, to waste on things that may make you seem busy, but aren't really moving the needle or like getting you up and running. So I think if there's one method like the boss, that's that you don't really need to quit your job in order to start something or, um, or buy something or acquire something. That's really interesting. So, so as, as opposed to shut the door on one venture, move completely unknowing into another venture straddle yeah. right? straddle between but how do you do that ethically um i think you're transparent and i think you just are really good at creating boundaries um you know maybe it starts on nights and weekends and i think the the first step is kind of a mind shift but this is for me my first step when i did this was it was kind of a mindset shift of i am no longer climbing the corporate ladder i'm not going above and beyond i'm not trying to get promoted I don't care if people are talking about me behind my back. Like my job now is just my job. And I want to like do a good job with what my responsibilities are. But all the little things that you do at work that are kind of like playing business and, you know, asking to go to that extra meeting, staying late to work on stuff, like you don't have to do it. Like there's there's nothing that says like you you have to do all this stuff. Like you can say no and just start, you know, really setting better expectations and boundaries at your work. Because now your mindset is like, I'm done climbing the ladder. I'm I'm done kind of trying to go that extra mile. I'm going to do the 20% of work that's going to get me 80% of the way there. And my like long-term path is now this other path. So I just need to like set constraints to free up time to start working on this other thing. So once you make that decision, right? So once you make that decision that this isn't my life's purpose and you found that next step, you can you can do that with transparency. Tell us how you did that. Um, I yeah, I, I probably went around it the wrong way. But my my plan was to I started doing real estate investing. It was kind of the first little side job I had. Um, so I was buying rentals. I was fixing them up. Um, it's nice because a lot of that you don't really need to be there. It's very easy to do just through texting and and calls the way I was doing it. Um, so. My plan was to basically quit as soon as I like got married and was able to get on my wife's health insurance. Um, so I had gone in and basically went to quit um, and ended up negotiating a uh, like three day a week, 60% working capacity uh, arrangement at my company. And it worked out great for both of us. So I was still able to you know put my time in with my job. I had a prorated salary. I kept all my benefits. Um, and I had some extra time to, you know, be on site at projects, uh, do more networking, find more deals, um, all the kind of stuff I wanted to have a little more time to do. 
but it was also great because you know anytime I needed a loan, like I had, I still had W two income, so um, you know I didn't have to do a ton of hard money or even uh, on like commercial asset based lending. I could do some like just normal conventional W two loans on some of those first properties that kind of get me started. Um, so it was kind of a good one win both on the employer side because I was really you know still making an impact because I was able to do kind of the like I said the twenty percent of things that I was doing that got us eighty percent of the way there. Uh, but also let me dip my toes in in kind of a more entrepreneurial path. That's really interesting. So you actually tried to quit. You yeah. actually tried to drop 1.0 and move to the next phase of your yep. of your life, but they actually held you held you hostage. They needed you. Yeah. Basically, yeah. I had, I had proposed it originally. I think a lot of people start trying to do four days a week. And my thought was like four days a week kind of just turns into five, a compressed five days a week. You try to do the same amount of hours in fewer days. Um, and I think with three days a week, you like the whole internal team like needs a process change and you need different expectations around when you're going to be available and all that kind of stuff. So I think it really like was the right amount of time for me to still be there and still be able to, you know, do important things, but cut out some of the time that like I, I probably didn't need to be there. That's interesting. Some of the time that I didn't need to be there, non-productive time that I can be using elsewhere. And you chose to jump into flipping houses as that first uh, venture. Yep. Um, so buying rentals and doing some flips. Uh, I did a few joint ventures with other developers. Um, I was even doing like a little property management on the side. I really just like dipped my toes all over real estate and trying to feel out where I wanted to fit in. Uh, I got my agent's license, so. Um, I didn't do, I didn't do a ton of like brokering for other people, but it was helpful for, for me to like be my own buyer's agent on a few places. So find the deal, get a little of the commission paid down. Yeah. And have MLS access, be able to like have a, you know, at Keller Williams email address, email all the brokers around with, it gives you a little more, uh, credibility sometimes, especially when you're getting started. That's interesting. So then at what point were you able to leave corporate world and and what was corporate world? Tell me about the consulting finance world that you were in. So I started right out of college at uh, one of the big four firms, PwC, on the consulting side. So it was a lot of, you know, the classic on a plane Monday, come back Thursday. Um, most of my clients were banks and we were doing um, tech and ops consulting on like the very boring side of their business. So a lot of like commercial loan servicing systems and things like that. Uh, we did a lot of benchmarking projects where we'd kind of go in and do a lot of interviews and compare the banks against each other. Um, so that was about five years of doing that on the road a lot. And then I wanted something a little more normal, like settle in a little bit, live in, work in the same city. Um, so I moved over to another consulting company, uh, Boss Consulting Group, but was on like the internal finance teams. So I was still working on projects just internally, you know, and not, not for our clients. It was just for the, the firm as a whole. Were you able to learn things from that consulting finance space that helped you with your new ventures? Yeah. I mean, I can write a hell of an email. Um, <laughs> no, I think the the biggest thing, and it sounds super wishy-washy, but like being pretty comfortable, like being uncomfortable. So walking into situations where you're not going to have all the information you're not going to know everyone, you're, you're, just, you know, as a consultant, you're always in these kind of like weird situations that sometimes are super stressful, you know, trying to get this last PowerPoint slide out while your plane's delayed, but you're under a deadline, like all of these kind of things come together and you just, everything goes wrong and you learn to just like adapt and go with it and figure it out. So I'd say it really trained me on like figure it out ability um, and just like professional communication along a pretty wide spectrum. So, you know, you have to change how you talk, how you present yourself, how you communicate when you're um, talking to C-suite level people versus, um, you know, processor entry level folks. And you're, you still have to interview these people or, you know, meet with them. And um, you, you know, you kind of have to adapt your communication style to a lot of different types of people, which I think has been super helpful in the entrepreneurship world where, one day I'm you know, talking to you, one day I'm talking to a lender, one day I'm talking uh, to the guys or subcontractors or um, potential partners or new, you know, wh whoever. It's a, it's a lot of different types of people with different types of backgrounds and being able to kind of fit in and tailor my communication accordingly is something that the uh, kind of consulting life really taught me well. 
So where have you found yourself now? Tell me about Jim's landscaping. Yeah, so I'm uh, definitely I'm not the founder. Just a quick correction on that. I uh, acquired the company in March of 2021, so last year. Um, it's kind of an extension from the real estate investing, where from a like investment thesis, I really like the idea of entrepreneurship through acquisition um, and kind of buying into a traditionally some might call boring. Uh, the fancier term would be like a durable company that's probably not going anywhere anytime soon due to some type of industry shock or changing technology or, you know, Google putting us out of business in the blink of an eye type situation. Um, So I wanted something that was like on that side of the spectrum. I think real estate also gave me a perspective on kind of what's going on with home services right now. And traditionally it's just been a, uh, unprofessionally run type of industry that I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit to just bring in a little more on like the customer service and professionalism side um, and do like a good job with the trade. But, you know, I think there's, there's enough way to compete and win just on the customer service side, which I felt I had a good grasp on um, and just keep the, you know, keep, keep everything the same on the actual like execution operation side. Um, I've since learned it's, it's, it's a lot more nuanced than I probably came into it and I was probably a little naive, but, um, that's, that's kind of the genesis of how that came to be. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because that's something that I've talked with folks about quite a bit is, you know, especially in the last few years where the trades have been really busy, um, over demand, um, you know, supply chain issues, you know, delays over budgets where, you know, is this a disruptable industry? Is this something that, you know, some entrepreneurs could come in and and kind of work through some solutions relatively easily? I think it depends, like, you know, people, people think in terms of different scale. And I think there's room for all, all of the above in the trades. I think, you know, my industry specifically, like there are going to be some tech players coming in you know, already in um, and helping with like robotics and robotic lawnmowers, uh, both for residential and commercial applications. I think that's going to be a interesting kind of thing to follow over the next few years. It's, it's definitely started. It's not there yet. I don't think there's like a clear winner, um, but that's a kind of an example of where like the venture style backed types of companies can come in and you know, do something on a relatively large scale. Um, I think there's also a ton of room where you're just a really good technician and you can go out and be a great landscaper, be a great designer, architect. You know, you you could do this as a solo person and make a killing. Um, you know, if you're if you're kind of like a high end person, you could you could charge some like pretty good rates to just go out and have a pretty good lifestyle and work on the projects you want to work on and not worry about employees. I think there's room on that end of the spectrum too. And everything in between. Um yeah, so I do think I do think it's all disruptable, but I don't think it's like the the core of it's going anywhere. Well tell us about the growth of acquisition, uh growth by acquisition opportunities that that you're looking at. Yeah, I think that's that's where there's still like a good amount of asymmetry and and some opportunity um, in this space where my my kind of idea has been, you know, it's not the one or two person type companies where it's like just a guy or or someone out doing the work, um, you know. But it's there's a manager, there's probably six to eight employees, an owner, and an office person is kind of like the the sweet spot I'm trying to find. Um, where there's not a lot of like great exit opportunities for that type of person who's been doing this for 15, 20, 30 years and is looking to retire. Um, you know, a lot of the younger generation has no interest in, in doing that. So um, I think traditionally a lot of those would be like passed down to to a kid. Uh, whereas now I think that's kind of starting to, to go away a little bit. Um, and I think there's opportunity to kind of buy cash flow and buy talent um at pretty reasonable rates compared to what software companies trade at um on a multiple basis. So what it's definitely high headache and it's gonna take a while to to kind of get my legs and do it. And there's some other people doing very very similar things that have just hit the ground running and and went went from zero to one and it's it's not really my path. But um yeah I still I still really believe that that's that's a good opportunity. 
what are some of the multiples that you're seeing in the trades for, for like buying two to three X earnings somewhere around there? Yeah, I think I think generally like the higher the revenue, the higher the earnings, the more you know professional of a company it is, the higher the the multiples end up getting, which is nice for someone that wants to grow. You know, if you can buy a two to three X and then someday exit at four to five X, that's that's pretty cool. Um, but that's yeah for the the smaller companies, I would say trying to get between two and three is is a good kind of benchmark. So now that you're in the entrepreneur world, right? So you're there, you're not working for the corporate uh, world anymore. You know, what what's stressing you out? What's keeping you up at night? Ah, man, you name it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's something that's deceptively comforting about having some constraints and like having a defined job. Um, you know, when everything's an opportunity and everything's your responsibility, it's hard to like really rein yourself in and stay focused. And I'm like predis- predis- predisposed to shiny object syndrome pretty heavily. Um, if you can't tell right now, I've had like five or six careers already. So, um, yeah, once you're in a company, there's, there's all these different kind of paths you can take to grow paths you can take to optimize existing operations, different like models to play out with. And you think of something as like, like landscaping, like it's been going on forever. Like there should be like, uh, like here's the model, just go plug and play. But there's, there's so much nuance to it. And I think sometimes you get a little tripped up just doing these half steps um, one way or another. And it's, it's been a little difficult to like commit to a path. So that's definitely different than the corporate world where it's like, I know my job, I know my next level. Maybe there's other two or three jobs in the company I may want someday. And this is, this is it. Um, I can go on vacation. I can pass my work off and not worry about it. Like I don't need to worry about building the culture. I don't need to worry about recruiting. I don't need to worry about paying people. Like that's all just kind of taken care of. Um, at least for me working for like big established reputable, like good companies. Um, I didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. Now it's like, I got to worry about all of it. And it's more of a question of priority and like purposely ignoring some things so that I can work on the important things. That's interesting way of, of looking at it. So, so what excites you about the future? I mean, the, the flip side of all that is there's like unlimited potential. It's like, I think it's very, that's very intriguing. Um, as someone again, who kind of likes uncertainty to an extent, it's, it's nice having, that opportunity for spontaneity and for, um, you know, I think, I think kind of like putting yourself in the path of luck and the more equity and leverage you kind of have on your life. I think you're just like maximizing the surface area where lucky things can happen. Um, and I don't even know what that's going to look like, whether it's someone I meet or, something that happens in the industry or some other random opportunity. But I think, I I think by like owning a company and putting yourself out there, I think you're, you're taking a pretty big step forward and just like maximizing that service area for, for getting a lucky bounce. And then the impact that that lucky bounce has on your life. I love it. So when you were, you know, working in the corporate world, you had, you know, folks that you could bounce ideas off of and you can share experiences, you know, now that you're kind of on this entrepreneur island, who are you, who are you sharing with? Who's your advisory board? Uh, man, I don't know. You open for a call after this? I, could, uh, uh-huh. <laughs> so, well, I know, I know EO has been very yeah, good. Yeah, no, I'm excited for that, for that whole path. Um, I've, I've been, I found like a pretty cool group on Twitter. Um, believe it or not, there's like in the, in the cesspool that Twitter can, become i think there's this world of like small business twitter that's been very very helpful and inspirational and um you talk about seeing templates and paths and like seeing people that are one month ahead of me one year ahead of me five years ahead of me two steps behind me that are still like looking for the first acquisition it's it's a really cool ecosystem um and just like super friendly willing to share transparent people that are um you know, the term we, we use a lot is just like building a public. So it's the good, the bad, the ugly, the, hey, watch out for this, or hey, this cool thing happened, let's let's all celebrate. Um, so that's that's been a fun ecosystem for me to kind of have dip my toes in. That's pretty cool. I've never heard of a sub ecosystem within Twitter. Is that like a hashtag group? Like how do you find those groups for <laughs> places? 
Yeah, there's a secret handshake. Um, yeah. It's a series of memes you have to put together. <laughs> um, no, I think, I don't even know how I started. I was following some people that were kind of in the real estate world and yeah. found a few other people that were more like half real estate, half business. And it jiggles from there. It's usually like a few people that have some of the bigger followings. And then you kind of just catch on to who else is talking about this stuff. Um, I don't know. It's pretty organic. I don't, I don't think there's like a official like club or hashtag for it. Um, it's, it's kind of like following the conversations and getting involved and, you know, every once in a while, like for example, someone will tweet out like, Hey, if you're interested in small business operations, these are the 10 people you need to follow right now. Got it. And people will do that every once in a while. So you can kind of like jump around and find your tribe a little bit. I love it. That makes a lot of sense. So are you still investing in real estate? Trying to. It's been a tough couple of years um, to find any deals that make sense for me as someone that's baseless using my own money. I'm not syndicating a ton. I've, I've taken on some investments when I do like joint ventures or if the uh, if it's the right place. But for the majority of it, it's just my own capital. And, you know, instead of parking everything in a brokerage account or something, I, I just, I think real estate makes a ton of sense. Um, so I'm playing that kind of for the long game and we're really just, taking your time, right? Waiting for the right um, deal to pop through, which hasn't happened for like a year and a half. So I didn't just kind of sit and twiddle on my thumbs waiting. Um, but it's a lot of time and energy is now on the, the business side. I think while the investment criteria is kind of similar, you know, buying a business versus buying say an apartment complex, you know, you're, you're buying an asset that creates cash flow that you have the opportunity to improve over time by, increasing revenue or decreasing expenses. Um, and then ideally you're selling at a higher multiple than you paid for it. That's kind of the game in a nutshell. Um, the difference is like the headache involved with that and like actually operating a company in my experience is in much harder and more time consuming than operating a apartment building where I can pretty much plug in a property manager and be relatively hands off. Um, you know, obviously like there's more, there's more cash flow in the interim with the business side of things. Cause I have, you know, a job on top of being an owner. Um, but that's, that's just been some of the trade off and it's been, it's been a, like kind of tough two years, just adjusting to all that Our you know, we had our first, uh, first baby three months after I bought the business. So that's also a pretty big life change. Um, and most of my energy has gone towards the business versus finding the next real estate deal. Um, and it's just been hard. It's the, with the market, like through COVID, the, the pricing and, um, you know, with cap rates coming way down, it was just, it was hard to find something as like a cash flow investor it's hard to find something that kind of fit my investment criteria. Right. Cause it's all about how you buy it. Right. And there wasn't a lot of good buying opportunities. Make your money when you buy. Yep. Yeah. So is that what was the genesis of, of acquiring the landscaping company is that, you know, the deal opportunities weren't there and you had to make a, make a move. Not really. I mean, it was kind of more of an expansion of anything else. Um, real estate was great, but it was something, like I said, I wanted to play like the slow game on and I didn't, you know, to make a job out of real estate, I think you either need to raise a bunch of capital and syndicate a bunch, um, or start doing more active like development deals. And I didn't really like either of those <laughs> options. Um, so I found my kind of way out of corporate and kind of like into a more entrepreneurial space. It's probably best bet was, you know, buying a company um, that was tangentially related. So I looked at, I looked at like a dumpster rental and demo company. I looked at a roof anchor installer, a um, couple of the landscaping companies. So I kind of ran the spectrum and, and some of the other trades that are out there. Um, but this one just <clears throat> kind of hit home for, for a number of reasons. What was your experience with the trades when you were in the investment game? I, I hated it. I hated, I hated everyone. It was like, it was, it was just crazy. It's like, you call, you know, you call 10 plumbers hoping four answer the phone, three show up to give you a quote and one actually gives us a quote back to you. Um, that was kind of my experience. I just, I, for someone that also tried to like semi GC some of his projects himself and like not have a, a stable of guys, you know, like professional general contractors have, um, it was it was very challenging. Huh. And how come growth by acquisition versus startup? Um, one, I think, you know, in trade specifically, they're just if you're not like a technician, 
you're in the red for a while trying to get started. You know, you're going to pay for labor, but not have, you know, we'll take landscaping as an example. Like say you just want to start mowing lawns. Most people who start mowing lawns start when they're a kid um, or 16, 18, right out of school, something like that, and do it on the side. You pick up your neighbor's lawn and then maybe another, but it takes a while to like build that root up. And then, you know, you, you just kind of like, one step forward, two steps back for a while. Cause then at some point you got to hire an employee you have to hire two employees. You got to buy a second truck and trailer. So the growth is like kind of slow and painful, um, for trade-based companies, specifically landscaping, but I'm sure it's kind of similar with, you know, an HVAC company. Um, and this is just kind of like a shortcut and something that was like proven, had a good route, had some employees. So it's for someone with zero landscaping background, I knew I needed like a team that could do the actual work while I was focused on um, learning, building, and you know eventually integrating. So did the did the owner, the founder, uh, exit right away, or did they hang on and help the transition for you? A little bit of both. Um, stayed on for a while, helping the transition. There was you know. A little bit of uh I'm gonna say an awkwardness, but it's like, you know, he sold the company, so and we really kind of like announced it a few days before closing to a lot of the guys. So I think it was powerfully me wanting to like solidify like it's you know, it's this is it now. It's you know, no longer his company, it's my company, but we're gonna try to do things as as similar as possible. Um so there's a little bit of that, I think a little bit of like Trying to say it pro, uh, pragmatically, but anyway, so he he basically was around. He would he would help, um, you know, bounce ideas off and keep me in check on things. And um, with landscaping in the Northeast, it's super seasonal. So the spring and like March, April looks very different than June, July it looks very different than October. So it's like each each season um, kind of comes with like a core activity that has its own process so doing spring cleanups is different than pruning it's different than fall cleanups is different than plowing so we he was very helpful on the phone and we chatted you know basically before the start of every season for the first year or so and he chatted just gave me the rundown and little intricacies all the customers or things to watch out for um so he's he's i think he'll like always return my tax and calls but um he wasn't like showing up to the shop or like helping with the operations he did he did help on like sales calls for a while um he did ask him this with me you'd go do introductions to uh, the existing clients with me is probably for six months or so so how have you differentiated the first company with the new co that you're owning it slowly <laughs> yeah um i don't think too much has changed on like the operations or execution side i think i've given the guys a little leeway and a little more expectations to like especially during the transition period of, you know, speed and efficiency is important, but right now like quality is much more important and we want to make sure during this transition time, we're doing a good job and kind of maintaining our customer base um, and the quality. So there, so if it takes a little while and we need to like spend more time doing a QA at the end of it, fine. I can live with that. I, I like was very, very kind of like on financially focused for the first six months or so just to, put the priority on maintaining quality, maintain the customers, maintain the employees and maintain my sanity. <laughs> um, not in that order. <laughs> um, I would say the one thing we have, we've changed pretty dramatically is like the customer service side of things and making sure like right now, even if it's not our office manager, we have backup call answering. Like my deal is like, you never hear voicemail. You should always get answered by a human. Um, we're super responsible for email um we let you pay with a credit card we send we have like a workflow for sending quotes accepting quotes scheduling the job closing the job sending a review um which is basically our chance to go back and fix anything and then sending the invoice so i think like on the, the back office side things have changed a little bit like we have a website you know we don't have a website before so some some basic things like that um yeah and do you have the growth opportunities in mind are you are you looking to acquire we're definitely looking to acquire um starting kind of to i think for my first company it was a little more <clears throat> of a uh, inbound process where i just wait to see what became available like i said i was working at the time so 
I didn't do like a proprietary search or anything like that. I just signed up for brokerage feeds and tried to get a feel and try to get some reps of looking at companies and figuring out what questions to ask and you know, how do you behave on the first seller call? What questions do you ask? What what about the next step? How do you put together a lot of our intent? So that was the first deal. It was very inbound. I think for the next one, it's going to be more targeted where it's like, I'm going to initiate the conversation. Um, so now that I'm kind of in the game and I know some of the other companies around, I have an idea of who I'd like to target and kind of a, can approximate their size, their credibility, their professionalism, like all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm just going to kind of start ticking off one by one, initiating some conversations and seeing where it goes. Very cool. Very cool. Well, it's been great learning from you. Now let's learn who you are. So I hear you say that you have one son. Tell yep. us about that. Yeah. So, uh, Emil, uh, was born in May, like I said, three months or so after we bought the company. So that was, <clears throat> that was just like a crazy, <laughs> crazy year last year, but um, he's awesome. I mean, obviously anyone who has kids will tell you life completely changes with the first one. So we're definitely feeling that, but, um, yeah, when, wouldn't, wouldn't change anything. It's been awesome. That's great. What else do you like to do? I see in the background for those listening, he's got a nice, uh, a nice display of certain golf balls back there. Are you a golfer? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I try to be, I wouldn't call myself a golfer, but I, I do like going on golf trips with friends. It's been a good way to like maintain, um, relationships across the country is just, I have probably two groups of friends that we meet like annually in a different city and hang out and play golf. Um, so I think that like consulting really got me into traveling and my wife and I, it's a big like priority for us. I think we really try to travel a lot and experience a lot of different things. And if I think if there's like one place where we prioritize their money or time, it's on, it's on traveling and trying to do new stuff. How come, why is that so important? You know, um, I think there's, there's a few different components. So I didn't grow up traveling. So it's something I always like wanted to do more of. And, um, I kind of caught the bug when I was traveling for work and got to see so many different things, meet so many different types of people get put in so many weird situations. And I think all of those are like really good life experiences and growth experiences. Um, we got the opportunity in 2019 and we both took some comments from our jobs and, and just we bought one way tickets to New Zealand and like, all right, let's go and we'll figure it out the rest once we get there. So we ended up traveling for about six months um throughout kind of that part of the world, like New Zealand and Southeast Asia. And we did a lot of um trading volunteer work in exchange for room and board. And by room and board, I mean like sleeping on the floor of a coffee shop in Vietnam, or um, we were like ropes course guides in Japan. Uh for two weeks, we worked at, we were like wedding servers in Queenstown, New Zealand. So we, we, we did all these like weird things and, um, met a lot of cool people. And I think it was just a very different way to, to travel that we hadn't done <clears throat> quite as much kind of, of that world. And, um, yeah, I think that was a pretty life-changing experience and I learned a lot from it and, um, probably helped me get to, to this today. I bet that sounds like a really amazing experience. A lot of EOers have similar experiences where they traveled. One of the gentlemen in my forum took his family and and went on his boat for a year, homeschooled yep. and did the whole thing. I, I love that sharing of experiences and and uh, sharing of ideas, right? So the mindset so that you're not <clears throat> on an island, right? That's the beauty of uh, of EO. So when did you realize that you were an entrepreneur. Was this a little kid type of mindset or was it the corporate broke you? Huh. Um, probably a little bit of both. I, it's such a, like a loaded word now, like entrepreneur. I don't even know right. if I've ever like really described myself as that. I think, you know, I think there's the, you know, with the machine, there are like the builders and the tinkers. I think I'm much more of like a, tinkerer than a builder. So it was always hard for me to get from until like the idea of like starting a company. I think I would just toil away and never actually get anything off the ground. So I think, you know, finding something that exists and just kind of like, you know, the engine's already built. Let's just like get it a little better. Um, I think that's much more fitting for my personality and skill set. Um 
So I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think, uh, I think the best way I've heard a phrase is, is, uh, Jim Cook, who founded Boston beer company, just Sam Adams, um, also alum that I have, uh, BCG where I used to work. So he, he came in and give a talk and, and read his book and everything. And he has a great analogy of, um, being able to differentiate scary versus dangerous. And I think there's a lot of things out there that are scary. And this is all him, not, not, I think, but he thinks I, I agree. Um, you know, what's scary, but not that dangerous. And then what's dangerous, but not that scary. Um, <clears throat> and so there's, there's analogies out there, but like the, the crux of it is like going and starting a business is like scary. But for me, you know, with a pretty good background, lucky, like went to college, have two pretty good companies on my resume, have the skill set to fall back on someday. Yeah, it's scary, but like my actual like downside isn't huge. You know, I'll be fine if it, and like a worst case scenario, um, you know, a lot of that's privilege and luck. And I totally recognize that, but it helps rationalize it where it's like a scary thing to do. But in the end of the day, it's really not that dangerous. And I don't think like even in a worst, worst, worst case scenario, like I'll be, I'll be okay. And I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, on the flip side, I think, you know, what's dangerous is like never taking a shot at something. And then you're 80 and you're like, shit, I, I should have just done that. Like, what was I, what was I so scared of? And I think that's, that's much more of the situation I've been trying to proactively avoid. Um, it's like, what, what would 80 year old James like actually regret here? Um, you know, see, it's like also coming true in like the business now where it's like, okay, really there are things I want to work on, but, um, there's also like, I love, you know, being home with my new, new baby. Um, so there's some days where like, I just stay home and watch them in the morning where maybe someone else would have woken up and like driven to the shop at six in the morning to, to get her better jump out of the business. But I think, you know, I would probably regret that later down the road. Cause I think you, I mean, you only have a little kid for three, four or five years, maybe before they're much more of like a human than a little baby. So I think I have this like really short window to kind of mix um and find the right balance between my responsibilities to the company but also you know what am i going to regret as an 80 year old someday it's so important and it's so profound right especially with the kids you know and people will you know try to rush through certain i just can't wait until they're out of diapers i just can't wait until they're walking i can't wait until they're in school and it's like what are you what are you rushing for like be more yeah. present within <clears throat> And I think entrepreneurism allows us, you know, to to have those special times, close those eyes and hold on to those memories that, you know, someone may be sitting in traffic and and have have missed. Um, it's funny you talk about, you know, uh, what was it dangerous versus. Um, versus uh, scary, scary, scary versus dangerous. I talk about risky versus reckless a lot. Right. So you know, you seem to have that ability, you know, with the numbers to never be reckless, right? So someone may say, oh, that landscaping company's got some pretty cool trucks and seems like they're all over the place. Let's make a buy on that. Let's make a run on that. But, you know, maybe that's reckless. Maybe they're levered up and it's and it's all smoke and mirrors. But, you know, you're looking at those numbers from your consulting background, which, you know, I think is 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 really cool for disruptive of, of, of those trade businesses. Yeah. I think, um, the other quick plug that's helped me a lot is the, it's Ryan holiday. Uh, ego is the enemy was kind of a foundational book for me too. And just being able to think like, is this something that's probably driven by ego? If so, like what's the opposite direction of that? Um, so from the trades and especially landscaping where it's like, like you said, the equipment and the trucks and the toys, like that's, it's cool and it's kind of the uh proverbial like measuring contest between companies sometimes of like what kind of equipment they have how new are the trucks what kind of excavators how many bobcats all that kind of stuff um where i think like a lot of that's probably more ego than useful um and if you're looking at just like return on assets or asset utilization and you have an excavator fine like how many how many like hours of use is it getting out of the year and does, does that make sense or does it make sense to just rent one when we need one? Um, so that's, that's kind of like a good, good barometer too, is just thinking of things in terms of, um, where is the primary driver to this? Probably like where you go, the not you go. 
That's very profound. He's great. Ryan Holiday. I have his uh, stoism, the daily, the daily messaging, um, which I, I love it. I love it a lot. Uh, well, let me ask you this. How would someone connect with you if they were wanted to connect with you, whether it's as a <clears throat> consumer or as a business partner or as a potential seller or as an EO member who uh, wants to connect and, and do a one-on-one? How do they, how do they connect with you? Yeah. Um, you know, email's totally good. James at uh, glad, G-L-A-D, cap, C-A-P, dot com. Uh, Twitter, like I mentioned earlier, glad underscore cap. Um, LinkedIn, I'm, uh, I, I am very, very eager to like <clears throat> meet people. And I think almost anytime someone reaches out that has, you know, either a question or wants to do something similar or chat, like I'm almost always, always up for that at some point. So um definitely encourage anyone to to reach out if they want to chat um and like i'm after this call i'm probably gonna do the same i was listening to some of the the previous guests um on the podcast and i'm i'm very excited to to reach out to a couple of them and see see if i can get some conversations as well cool well i i I hope you uh decide to join because i think you'll see a tremendous value in that and folks when you see james at one of the events make sure to go up and say hello to him because now you know him, right? James, thank you so much for sharing your time and wisdom and knowledge and experiences with us. I think our our folks really appreciate you. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it as well. And looking forward to chatting again soon. Folks, thank you very much. If you learned something today, if you laughed, if you were inspired, share this with somebody. If you thought about somebody, share it with them, but make sure to subscribe so that you hear all of these episodes moving forward. Again, James, thank you very much. I am truly grateful. Thank you, Mark. Folks, this has been another exciting episode of Leadership in Action, our Boston chapter of Entrepreneurs Organization podcast. We will see you next time. Leadership in Action is sponsored by the Boston chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization. As the world's only peer-to-peer network exclusively for entrepreneurs, EO helps transform the lives of those who transform the world.